We're in Melbourne with Adolfo Gentile. Adolfo, welcome. Thank you. Uh, tell us briefly what you do these days. What do I do? Well, technically speaking, I'm, I'm retired, but that's, uh, <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth yeah. than that. I'm, I'm uh, first of all doing a PhD after so many years because of what happened beforehand to me in, in my career. And uh, I'm also involved with the uh, NATI uh, in a kind of consultancy basis. Okay, that's the, the, the National, National Accreditation, Accreditation Authority System in Australia. In Australia, right, for right, translators yeah. and interpreters. I'm uh, on the editorial boards of a couple of journals, among which Babel. Mm -hmm. um, I am translating, taking translation jobs, uh, not in a full-time fashion in any kind of way, but I just want to keep my hand in. And I'm, I've got the luxury of being able to actually say no okay. to, to some, yeah. so I choose yeah. what, what, what I, what okay. I, I mean, you know, I'm not earning a living through translation, but I, yeah. I'm actually quite determined to keep my hand yeah. in. And then um, I'm also doing a couple of uh, basically uh, training consultancies around Melbourne with the different interpreting agencies, uh, basically uh, uh, um, professional development, if you like, mm -hmm. but also um, a training needs determination. Yeah. Your focus is definitely on, on interpreting. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, no, well, I can't say that. Uh, okay. it's, it's very hard in this country to make a definitive statement what your focus is. My, my, was my professional focus is on translation, yeah. that is I do it, and, and the rest of it is more probably better described as, as in, in interpreting and translating pedagogy. Okay. okay. If we but want to put you're it training in kind of, both written and, yes, and, yes, and spoken. Yes, okay. that's right. And then finally, to finish my little yeah. list of things, I, I do the occasional lecture at Monash and you know, and other places that they call me from time to time. Yeah. So, yeah. What were you doing before you nominally retired? Before I nominally retired, I was at the Refugee Review Tribunal as a member. So that, can you explain what that is? Yes, yeah. well, that is a, an appeal uh, tribunal, an appeals tribunal for persons, who, uh, asylum seekers who have been refused uh, refugee status. Mm -hmm. Now, since I left the slight change in administration, they've all been combined in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Nevertheless, there is still a division only for refugees. So the more interesting part from the point of view of this discussion is why did I, yeah. how did I end up, yeah. end up there? Well, it was really quite a, um, a very um, um, disappointing period of my life that I did that because I'd been, I'd spent about 20 years actually building up courses and, and materials and research. This and is a deacon. This, this is a deacon and, yeah. and it's precursor or yeah, preceding institutions yeah. because there was a transmogrification during the, that period. Um, and uh, we were always, uh, in general, you know, universities were being cut in funds. But, um, and I was trimming things because I was actually uh, running the whole uh, uh, school. And um, and one fine day, the dean said to me, "Next year you're going to run this course with two hours lectures and one hour tutorial." And I said on the spot, "No, you are going to run it," and I resigned. This was to train interpreters translators and interpreters yeah. on a model that they would use for studying French literature or, something. Yeah, or sociology or, okay. or history. Or, so they were so, prepared to no, pay because the I mean at that stage. Um, uh, what we were doing was already reasonably well known elsewhere. I was involved with the with the International Federation of Translators as as it's no, not then at present, but I was soon to be at that time. And then, um, and I just couldn't um, morally yeah, yeah. pretend, yeah, yeah. basically. And and the reasons uh, that they did this were not simply because they didn't they 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 didn't have money. I think it was. It's a phenomenon which I've met in other parts of the world as well, that less now, but at the time, um, translation was still regarded by a lot of universities as some hands-on stuff that you shouldn't really touch. Okay. So yeah. there was unease by the historians and by yeah. the philosophers and okay. by, you know, and it wasn't communicated to me plainly, otherwise I would have argued. Yeah. <laughs> 
It was when, when did that program close? It, well, I finished in '97 there, but it closed in '99. They okay, had to yeah, yeah. go through the, the pipeline. So the dean. So, so that the so, so, Well, you know. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah. Some but what's strange is since yeah. then a whole lot of other yes. training has taken off in yes. Australia. Yes, that's yeah, right. So. so then we've had uh, uh, the advent of overseas students. Right. Yeah. And this has yeah. been a catalyst. Yeah. For 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 many many courses and some of which um, I don't regard as actually good uh, yeah. training programs for for interpreters or translators. Okay. Nevertheless, that's just my view. Okay. But uh, so really, that, that's why. So so I, by sheer coincidence, the, the the day that I finished at Deakin, I opened the newspaper and looked at that, and I had been asked to speak to the members of the tribunal before about interpreters, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, that sounds like a, because there was no hope of. In Australia, anyway, of getting another job in the same area. Yeah. Academia, but then you, you got a job where, he, where you were deciding who stays and who goes. Yes, that's right. As an interpreter. Yes. That's that's very interesting, I think. Yes. That's well, really it's because the, the, the members of the tribunal, although many of them are lawyers, the legal training is not a, a requirement. Mm. The whole point of the tribunal system, which has been going in Australia since about the very early 90s, is that it is a a system of resolving administrative decision disputes in a very uh, economical and, and relatively fast mm. manner. And so that's, that's the way that, that it's okay. organised. Now, I think uh, now that they've been incorporated into the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, I probably think that they wouldn't um, accept non-lawyers, but, okay. you know, it, it's... You used remote interpreting. Well, yes, we, we use, yeah, yes, we used uh, yes, we used uh, video conferencing, yeah. basically, yeah, yeah. Um, a lot, um, but for highly sensitive cases, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. and at the beginning it was a real challenge because the technology wasn't really good enough. The number of um, um, packets of information flowing over the wires was not sufficient to get to give a smooth mm -hmm. uh, and and undisturbed. Yeah. Thing and, and and you know when when it really interfered we we yeah. we actually adjourned. It's not that we kept going, but then just in a few short years we were able to to do that. But even then we only did that for cases that were, although they're all sensitive, but they were not uh, of the um, they did not contain particular facets which were uh, absolutely uh, more difficult and therefore. Not suitable to doing this over the uh, over the video. Okay. So you know, okay. I still do travel to the detention centre. So it was combined places. with face to face. Oh, yeah. oh yes, yeah. it was never okay. exclusively. I mean, right. a lot of the um, the tribunal in Melbourne, uh, probably uh, eighty percent of its applicants were living in and around Melbourne. Oh, okay. okay. So it's it's not that that was the way, the way that that was uh, an exception if you couldn't have a face to face hearing. Yeah was never a, a thing. But then uh, continuing my story, if you like, um, what they did was it was a blessing in disguise in a way because I, I was able then to see the interpreter from the point of view of the person working with the interpreter, yeah. which I had, of course, a theoretical understanding of. I had, a, you know, I knew because I participated in a lot of, of interpreting, but it's not the same when you're actually sitting on the other side of the table, not understanding a single thing yeah. and having to make a decision which is quite um, uh, weighty for the person sitting opposite me. So, so does that mean you became aware that not all interpreters are great? Well, I knew that so, before okay, then, right. but I did uh, become more interested in finding out why. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I, I had the... Um, the fortune then of having gone through all the phases, I, I you know I started out as an interpreter back in days as a as a teenager when like a lot of other people here yeah. for, for for family and for other people, and then uh, so it went on and and uh, and I realised that in the classroom you know even though we did a lot of exercises and, and things like that it was never the same the feeling is never the same because you do understand both twice what whatever is being said if you know what I mean. Yeah. And that, so that, I, I think that has changed my um, 
changed my approach to some of the training issues and some of the actual mm. competency issues that, that are around. Can we go back to, well, I'm interested in, in, in your mid-20s or when you were finishing your studies. Yes. Uh, but also you came to Australia. When I was saying, 12. From? From Italy. Okay, it's not speaking English. Not speaking English, no, okay. not, not, not a word. So you've really been through the whole system. Yes, the, the, the whole system. The, yes yeah. which many, many, many people in this country yeah. have been through. Uh, but it's at different stages, they've had different experiences. So what, did, mean, you, what did you study then at, 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 the at, at university? At university, I, started, I did a, a, a degree in languages, uh, Italian and French. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then what and, did you do with that? And what did I do with that? Uh, very little. I did some teaching part-time. Yeah. But then I, I went on and did the, a master's in uh, education and administration, mm -hmm. which was very interesting to me and, and enabled me to... By that time, I was working in the, my very... As soon as, even before I graduated, I was working because I, I had to work because my father became ill. Anyway, it's another story, but I had to go part-time, finish my first degree part-time. Mm -hmm. And so I had taken a public service job because they were allowing some hours for study leave okay. every week. So that was the reason I went to that. And then, and then uh, eventually in 75, uh, George Strauss, who was running the RMIT course at RMIT, the, the interpreting course at RMIT, the very first one in Australia, um, I, I went there and, and um, applied for a job there, and I got that job. And so I went doing on from what? there, doing, doing some Italian teaching to interpreters. Oh, okay, all right. But you weren't an interpreter. You well, I was in the same. Oh, if that you define it in the same way. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've been interpreting, if you like, since I was thirteen. Okay, all right. All right. I mean, okay. you know, but that's that's um, yeah. So, were you trained as an interpreter? No, no, no. I, this is why yes. the things happen. There, there was very little budget. training around. There was no training. That, one. <laughs> that yeah. was the first yeah. training. Yeah, yeah, at, the, yeah, yeah. at the same time, there was a course which started at the at the Canberra College of Advanced Education, and at the school and at the language centre of the University of New South Wales. In the mid seventies. In the mid seventies. Okay. And also at the RMIT Technical College, a lower level course, uh, according okay. to the. What was going on at the time, which is what I'm writing about in this thesis, okay. is the policy which led to the setting up of the National Accreditation Authority for okay. Translators and Interpreters. Okay. Because I, 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 I'm fascinated by uh, the fact that this thing happened then and not at some other time. Yeah. And it happened in the way it did. And so, yeah, so that's what I did. And, and then uh, we, from RMIT... Uh, I mean, I, thinking back on it, this business of uh, people... Well, the RMIT are, is the Royal, Royal Melbourne, Melbourne Institute, Institute of Technology, Technology yeah. University now. University, OK. But at the time... So it's like a polytechnic that yes, became the university. Right. At the yeah. time, it was a, a, a polytechnic, but yeah. yes, it was... Yeah. And these were called advanced colleges here. Yeah. So was uh, Victoria College, where we went next after RMIT. When I say we, the mm. group... This little oh, okay. group, right. because the same thing happened that I was team. closed out. Ran, ran out of money, <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, yeah. And so you know, um, with the first um, actual uh, uh, attempt at closing it down, we foiled by appealing to the prime minister, mm -hmm. who who rang the was then called the principal of RMIT, meaning this the the head uh, yeah. person. And he said, uh, I want you to find the money for this course out of your allowance, you know, out of what right. we give you. And, of course, that, that... Which prime minister was that? Fraser. Malcolm Fraser. Oh, OK. Yeah. He did something good. Yes. And, and yeah. uh, well, uh, that period was the, yeah. the period where multiculturalism actually bloomed. Yeah. And, and, and at the same time, the migrant groups that were here began to find a voice. OK. And, and other people um, in the mainstream community took up their causes, which hadn't happened before. So and there so, was a debate about, oh yes, about was the a, shape of oh Australian yes, culture. There, there was a debate, yes. So when you were then moved out of RMIT... Yes, we went to... Victoria College. Victoria College. Right. Uh, th that's a shortened version because for, a half, half, for half a year we were called something else. All right, okay. Don't worry about that. <laughs> and then that went to Deakin. And that, that, the, that amalgamated with Deakin University. All right, okay. All right, so okay. it was a, a 
tortuous process because a lot of all the all the colleges of advanced education mm. that were there either became universities or amalgamated the universities. So people didn't really want translation and interpreting. Not not as a course, but I mean okay. to say people is perhaps university administrators. Or yes, yeah, or, okay. or even academics. I mean, I'm okay. sorry to say that, it, but that's... Was that related to the debate about multicultural Australia or, or not? Uh, to, to a small extent, yeah, okay. there was a little undertone that, you know, we would have to buy books in Italian and in oh, Turkish no. oh, and, no. and that, they <laughs> cost a lot more because they have to be brought, you know, yeah, this sort of thing. Okay. Never, never anything overt because the people working in, in these yeah. uh, institutes are, are never that crass, but... <laughs> okay. Nevertheless, you know that's the the thing, the feeling that I had anyway, and and uh, and then it was simply that a, as even now in many places, I don't understand what interpreting and translating means. I mean, the media doesn't really understand. Yeah. yeah. You know, lots and lots of people have the wrong, or, or at least a, a very skewed yeah. idea, and this is a big problem. And and you know, this is if we get the research, that's what. I've got a few ideas about that. How to okay, let's, let's, that. let's yeah, go into that. Right. What, what kind of research do you think we need? Yeah, okay. Well, in Australia especially, I don't know, is Australia different in this? Or well, yes, so Australia is different thing? because what happened was, uh, and I, I'm, it appear like a digression, but it actually cool. isn't. Um, when we had a critical mass in the training, we then started to look around the rest of the world to find to see what was going on and very little was going on. What years are we talking about? We're talking about, about um, from about 79 okay. onwards. Yeah. Britain had began, begun to make some noises about this. The Institute of Linguists was there but they didn't have the, the things that it has now. And the people that made the most um, noise about this were either uh, social workers, counsellors, sociologists, psychologists, you know, mm -hmm. in other words, okay. pro professionals yeah. who actually saw the problems firsthand. And the same thing happened in Australia. Yeah. The first people who wrote about the, the problems that they were having was with their patients or with mm -hmm. their... And so this, this kind of got the ball rolling. and, and, and uh, With interpreters. With interpreters, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah. But also with translators because... It, here, anyway, there was little point in differentiating because of the actual availability of people with any kind of skill in this area. So the person who was interpreting on Monday, on Tuesday, might well be translating a brochure on, on a gastroscopy. Still it, pretty you know. much the case, I Well, it is. Not, a, not, not as much. I mean, right. I can say this clearly about that period. Yeah, okay, yeah. It would be more difficult to, to make their statement. Yeah, yeah. Now, because we have differentiated ever since NARTI started and we had different accreditations and we have different accreditations. So, so um, the, the um, you know, we, we, we looked around and, and, and we sort of, we developed what we thought we needed. And then in 95, it wasn't until 95, that the Canadians uh, decided to... Uh, set up a conference for um, interpreters and translators in the social sphere. That was the Aurelia conference. Mm -hmm. And after that, it was called Community Interpreting. Right. And when this came out, I wrote a, a thing saying, what, what are you doing? What is this Community Interpreting? What does it mean? You know, what, you know okay, everybody's got their definition. Anyway, the horse has bolted. I lost my, <laughs> my battle. Everybody says Community Interpreting. Yeah. Because at the time there was other there were other things like um, oh public, public service well but that hadn't quite gelled by then yeah, yeah. but then ad hoc interpreters yeah. in in Sweden and um, um, I look all sorts of other yeah, things dialogue well, interpreting well that was later as well but yeah, anyway yeah. Um, so so when the first time I went to Europe to actually say anything about what we were doing well first we said it to our own Australian Linguistic Society. Myself and Jill Blewett from Adelaide, who was running a course which was similar, and, and that was that. And then um, in '86, I went to Trieste to that now, which has now become famous conference about conference interpreting. But I went anyway, and I presented what we were doing, 
and the general reaction, I can't say, was positive. Well, they were doing all the empirical stuff on, on the mental process. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yes. But, yes, so but there were lots more different. than simply yeah. the staff at Fiesta yeah, yeah, yeah. at the conference. Yeah. But the, the idea that you train somebody to go to a doctor with somebody else was not really something that they regarded okay. as interpreting. Okay. Right? Yeah. I, I, and, okay. I, and I got this everywhere I went. Yeah. I went to Ezit, I went to Aik, who in, in fact refused to see me. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and you know I, I went to um, to um, uh, Heidelberg. I went to um, the Polytechnic of Central London at the time, which is okay. now the Westminster yeah. University, uh, just to, to learn, you know, to to, yeah. to see what was going on. And none of them had actually had this concept. So we here came at it a different way. And and I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I think that because in other parts of Europe. Migration up to then, anyway, had been either of the elite kind or the guest worker variety. Mm -hmm. In Australia, that only had existed at the turn of the century with the Canucks, who then were expelled. Yeah. That's, that's another story. But here, it's only in the last few years that we've had what, the four, five, seven visa, which is for for working holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Before that, if if you came as a migrant. You came as a migrant, you stepped off the, the boat or wherever it was, and you were uh, just about equal to any other citizen except you couldn't vote yeah. for the federal for the federal uh, yeah. elections or the state, but you could vote for the local. So we've had a different view of what a migrant here yes. is, and I think that has influenced a lot, you know, because um, there was very little of this, you know, why do you want to spend this money on these people who can't speak English? They should learn English. There was a lot of this. They should learn English. Okay. Are we more aware that we are all immigrants? On this all of this? Well, well, so not. But if you were to read the newspapers in the last few okay, days, yeah. you wouldn't. <laughs> but, but I think that, I think yes. I think okay. it, I mustn't be too uh, pessimistic. Yes, the, the, there is a, a different, uh, mainly because uh, a lot of people have had a lifetime here and are able now to actually describe and explain okay. to others. What, what, what it is, you know, what happens. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a very kind of amateurish understanding at the beginning because all I wanted was labour. I mean, the, the whole... In '45, they started this migration program. Okay. And it was really workers. because, you know, work. Yeah, yeah. We want to work. Yeah. We, you know, sure. We've got the yellow peril coming from the north and there's only a few of us, so we better do something. Yeah. I mean, uh, that sounds very crass, but that's... No, why just three indeed it was, you know, that's what it was. Yeah. We're getting off topic. Sorry, right? sorry. What kind of research do we need now, do you think? Okay. Any ideas? Is this is for beginner doctoral students. Okay. Well, um, I think for beginner doc beginning doctoral students, uh, there's still plenty of scope to actually investigate what happens when people interpret or translate. Mm -hmm. um, Cognitively or socially or but interaction? I don't think you can yeah. separate uh, yeah. Yeah. the two. Well, you may be able to separate it in a thesis, but yeah. in, in general requirements, I think that, uh, I mean, if, if I've learned anything, is that this is not a linguistic phenomenon. This is a, a social, it's a communication thing. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, if we could, if we were able to find out find better ways of explaining that, we would be in a much better position in all sorts of ways, including with research ideas. So I think that's one area um, which would probably be suitable for, for beginning doctoral students. Um, I think another area which I think is, is needed is to find out why people want to keep wanting to compartmentalise interpreting and translation. They want to create other, they want, you know, legal interpreting. I know, but what we need is family violence interpreting. Yeah, okay. You know? And I'm yeah. fascinated to know why. Yeah. And I've got some theories <laughs> about that, but but there would be it would be good to see why that is. That's more, rather than interpreting thesis, is more of a <laughs> almost a history of ideas, but mm. nevertheless, it would be something that I would feel would be useful to the yeah. to the profession. You know, yeah. um, and I think you were present 
at a seminar here not so long ago where somebody wanted to create a, a thing called the academic in, a translation. I don't know whether you recall as a, yeah, it, as it, a it, particular it, yes, genre. Yes, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure whether it's actually a product of the academic um, mentality, you know, yeah. that you that you sort of carve out a niche, because I can't see it in terms of uh, discipline, and I can't see it in terms of practice either. So, you know, there, there, there are a couple of things that, yeah. that I think. Yeah. That's the basic politics of, of, of a profession. Yes, that's right. That's right. And yeah. and uh, um, and the other thing is that. In my view, anyway, in my humble opinion, fundamentally, um, we struggle to say anything very useful about what's good interpreting and what's good translation. Yeah. It's a very old thing. It's, it's, yeah. you know, it's Goethe and before him and, all, and Cicero and all the rest of it. But um, we have different methods now and we have different possibilities of actually looking at Real, uh, you know, like there's a lot of work being done in Italy, as you know, on corpus. Uh, so, so I'm not saying that that's the way you do it, but I'm simply saying that um, there have been attempts, but I think that they seem to end up um, getting mired into uh, basically what is and what is not an acceptable expression in the target language. That's linguistics. Yes, but okay. um, but is it translation? I mean, this is what I'm saying. You know, it's probably both. But yeah. I, I, anyway, I, I feel that that wouldn't wouldn't hurt to to or to revisit the s- translation quality or something. Yes, like that, yes, sure. yes. But you know, translation because it would help a lot in in the in pedagogy and also in assessment. Yeah. Because well, some people argue assessment is part of pedagogy, but I'm thinking it that way because of my involvement with Nati, yeah. where we're now going through from zero and going through the whole thing again and, and devising what I hope, I mean, I trust will be a much better uh, series of, of tests which um, will, will uh, should, you know, get on board in, in the next couple of years. So and I think that, that that is another thing that has um, characterised the Australian situation because uh, this thing that was set up in 77 has actually the, the accreditation, the accreditation authority, authority yeah, sorry, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. has actually shaped to some extent yeah. the profession, yeah. and um, there you know there are people that disagree with it altogether, uh, and it's interesting to you know even to list the the reasons, but but it tends to be um, people who are fearful of not performing. Up to scratch. Okay. I mean, that's. that's uh, I don't want to. Okay, you know, I'm sort of blunt, but that, that's really what it is. Okay. Yeah. Adolfo, thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Okay.